the number of reviews which mention the narrator it's 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 quite astonishing listening to the audiobook made the experience even more impactful with the narrator doing an excellent job of bringing the material to life in fact i have a much cheaper book going which i'm doing now because yeah. you know I, I invested in you because you're amazing and i sent them and told them listen to <laughs> Listen to <Graham. laughs> the messages in this audiobook will inspire and empower you, as they have inspired and empowered me and many around me. To make the most of the transformations available in this book, repeat the messages out loud, or select any messages which strike you. You can select phrases or sentences and write them down or say them out loud, and even transform them into first-person declarations. Anthony Hilton, how are you? I am well, by the grace of God. Thank you very much, Graham. <laughs> it's great to finally meet you, even though we're thousands of miles apart, I'm sure. Where are you? I'm actually in Norway. Wow. Why are you yes. in Norway? Because you don't sound Norwegian. No, actually, I'm British, but... I married, I met a Norwegian lady in Jerusalem, Israel, and we married in Jerusalem, Israel, and we had our first kid in Bethlehem. Wow. Now, was that deliberate to have the first kid in Bethlehem? Yes, it was cheaper than Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, but being a, a man of faith as you are, um, Bethlehem, pretty special place because, you know, some pretty famous people have been born in Bethlehem. Exactly. But believe me, it was the price. It so, was the price. So, yeah, yeah. Because uh, when you go to the Palestinian National Authority, which is the birth certificate which my first son had with my present wife, um, uh, we're talking quarter price. Really? Really? Yeah, is that we just were, because we it's a small town two. versus a big city? Is that just the, the, the No, reason? this is... Um, Palestine National Authority versus uh, Israel. Oh, I see. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yes. So of it's course. actually a different yes. area. Yeah. And and obviously, uh, it's the Holy Family Hospital. So it's a pretty nice place to be. Catholic Holy Family Hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was cheaper, so we moved over to Beth. In fact, we did it a lot when when we were living there. If you wanted dental work. Uh, we would go over the border. We would only live in 10 minutes, half an hour, 20 minutes from the border. So, so why, we were were you, why were you living in Israel? Well, uh, I had a dream. Do you want to hear all this stuff? Yeah, I do. I want to get yeah. some background on the man who wrote the book. Okay, so December 20th, 1998, I'm in Stockholm, Sweden, visiting a friend. Uh, I'm planning to go to London for Christmas. And I had a dream, flew high into the night sky through the stars, went far away to what I thought was the Far East. And then a voice said, you'll go somewhere for seven days, then you will return, and you'll go back for seven years. Go and help the charismatic church. So I wake T up from the Wait dream. a second. Tell me about that <laughs> voice then. Okay. Well, I had been trained over years of, or let's say untrained, unlearned and trained. In the Baptist charismatic communities I grew up in, we didn't really trust God would speak through dreams. But gradually, as the Lord led me over the years, I began to understand it was the main way he communicated. So over time, I began to listen to my dreams. For example, I had an interview. I had two interviews, one in Poole and one in Doncaster. One was a religious education down in Poole, religious education teacher with a good department. I think it was near the sea. It was a nice area. The other was in an industrial Doncaster, which didn't look that exciting. So I, <laughs> on the Friday, I spoke to the people in uh, in Doncaster and asked them, is it possible that I could change the interview time? Because they were the same time. And they said, yes, of course, that'd be fine. And then at the last second, they said, and uh, why did you want to change? I said, oh, because I have another interview at the same time. Oh, we would love to have you for interview, but not, uh, but we can't change it. 
So, so how much uh, did they uh, want you? <laughs> well, yeah. And by the time I finished talking with them, it was gone three o'clock. So when I rang pool to try and change the pool one, which is the one I thought would be more exciting, uh, there was nobody there. <laughs> so over the weekend, I had a dream pushing me north. So I concluded to go for the Doncaster job. And so I cancelled the pool one and everything ran smoothly, got the job. Great. Right. Well, they did. They did want you. OK, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was like they they wanted to be valued. They wanted to know that we weren't putting them as a second. Option. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, they want them. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. And you'd mentioned it was another interview and they're thinking, how much does he want us? Exactly. Yeah, I see. That was their. Th yeah, OK. Yeah. And so I learned how to follow dreams. And so by the time I got to December 20th, 1998, I knew more or less the voice of the Lord and 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 I was pretty crazy already. I was living in Denmark. I was visiting Stockholm, Sweden. I was doing an alternative teacher training course in Denmark, living in Stockholm, visiting Stockholm, Sweden in an atheist house. I have this dream. And then after the dream, I followed a pattern which I'd learned, opened the Bible at random, which was also very unacceptable in my upbringing. We used to always make the joke. They opened the Bible and it said, and Jesus went, Judas went and hanged himself. And they said, oh, I don't like that one. Let me try again. And they opened again. It says, go thou and do likewise. So <laughs> we used to <laughs> joke about this. But then gradually the Holy Spirit was teaching me how to hear God through opening the Bible and through dreams. So I had the dream on December 20th. I hear the voice. You'll go somewhere for seven days, then you will return. Then you go back for seven years. Go and help the charismatic church. Get my Bible out. I say, Lord, can you please give me the scripture to go with the dream? So my opening is no longer random because I prayed. Just like Peter was drawing lots to decide who would replace Judas. It was Matthias or the other guy, Barsabas, I think. They drew lots, but they prayed first. So it's not chance. So I prayed. I opened. David was calling the foreigners in Israel, or in Jerusalem, in Israel, I think it was, to help with the preparation, the building of the temple. I said, okay, looks like you're going to Israel. So I canceled my ticket to London, my reservation, which was MY6666, and I booked a reservation to Israel for seven days. The, the, what, the flight number was 666? The reservation number for London was not 666, 6666. Sorry, it wasn't okay. really 666 at all. Okay. Okay. Still, the, the, the repetition of sixes gets to a guy. Yeah. It didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So that's how I ended up going to Israel. And then um, I was going to be there seven days. So I looked around. And then I came back first to Sw Sweden goodbye to my friend, over to my teacher training course in Denmark. They already knew I was crazy. So I just told them, bye. And they didn't even try and persuade me. They would usually try to persuade you, but they didn't try. They went back to London, up to Doncaster, where I owned a house, gave away hundreds of books, came back to London. And then on January 17th, 1999, I moved to Israel for seven years. And after three months, I thought, how is God going to keep me here for seven years? That was the question. And yeah. during that seven years, I met the lady who is now my wife. And what's fascinating is when I went back last year or the year before, a Jewish lady told me, you came to get your wife, because that's exactly what Jacob did. Jacob served seven years for a wife in the Bible. That He went and he was in love with Rachel. And then he ended up being sneaked Leah because they didn't show the wife, the bride before they were actually married. And so then he had to serve another seven years for Rachel. And so this Jewish lady immediately picked up, you came to Israel to get your wife. Wow. Well, I also <laughs> have a wife from another country. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the northwest of England, and when I was 18, my parents emigrated to New Zealand. And when I was 21, they said, oh, it's not really for us. We're going back to Britain. And I said, well, I like it here in New Zealand. I'm going to stay. So at the age of 21, I didn't leave home. I was abandoned on the other side of the world. Um, but, but anyway, within a few months of them leaving, I went to a wedding and danced with a girl 
who is now my wife. Yeah. And coincidentally, I lived in New Zealand for seven years in total. So oh, that's very a, nice. That's a bit you cosmic, isn't going it? On too. In hey. fact, <laughs> uh, it wasn't even by chance that I met my wife because um, I'm, I'm I'm supposed to be, you know, the great servant of the Lord. I've been sent there on a dream and everything. But by the time we reached the end of, uh, I think it was October, it's t- times were hard. <laughs> and, you know, I was getting dreams about it's better to leave free than be deported. Okay. So <laughs> we were we were like heading into the year 2000. So the authorities were worried. They were worried that the Christians were going to go and do something crazy. Oh, really? Okay. In, at the end of 99 going into 2000. Why, so, why were they particularly worried? Well, there were some people called Concerned Christians, and they were planning something which I don't think I'll even mention, but they were planning to do something on the Temple Mount which would be utterly unacceptable. Okay, right. That's the That was apparently in the air. Right, so, so, all, so this, these were extremists, but all Christians became a worry then. Is that right? Because, yeah, in, in, in Israel, it's... it's, it's, it's um, and let's put it this way. Um, they will say some people are going to try and kill our bodies. But the Christians are trying to kill our souls. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> right. okay. So, I mean, I've been to... Uh, uh, and I, you, were very, not, you were very overtly Christian as well. You didn't keep it to yourself. <laughs> okay. so, 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 basically, in Israel, you have to navigate very carefully, especially if you're like me, someone sent by God, you have to navigate very carefully what you say. Um, I mean, the rabbi's teaching is the richest, the best. I learned more about my faith in two years than I learned in 30 years living among the Gentiles. But when they talk about Jesus, it's all gone. All wisdom disappears. And, they, and, and because they are concerned that they are going to end up with kids who eat pig. They look at the Christians eating pig, and they're very concerned that their kids will end up eating pig. So, so when you're in Israel, you have to be extremely, um, extremely wise, especially if you are a person who's been sent on a crazy dream, because you know you've heard of Jerusalem syndrome. Lots of people go to Jerusalem and start thinking they're the Messiah. They think they're Elijah. They think they're one of the characters from the Bible. And not only that, it's not just Christians. It's Jews too. <laughs> right. So there's something about Jerusalem which stirs up the end time scenarios, which makes people think we are the two witnesses. I'm Elijah. I'm uh, I'm David. I, I met I met messiahs by the dozen when I lived in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> you see, a, a bloke I used to know had the opposite experience. He was Jewish. He was American. He lived in Fresno, California. It was while I was working in radio, and he was a radio consultant. And I used to read his his monthly newsletter. I used to love it. It was called One to One. His name was Jay Trackman. He's died now. He's a lovely, lovely guy. And uh, I was in America, and I messaged him and said, I'd like to come and visit you. I read your stuff. I'm on the radio, and I find it inspirational for my work. And he said, yeah, yeah. So he picked me up at the airport in Fresno, and we spent the day at his house, and then we went out for a meal, and then I got a flight and carried on on my my trip to Seattle. But he said, as a radio consultant, he consulted radio stations all over the world. He'd go in there, and he'd listen to their station and give them tips on how to make them sound better and basically how to make more money from advertising as well, but how to make the product on the air better. And he got to consult a radio station in Israel. And he said, for him, it was uh, amazing because he was Jewish, and you know, it was like a something that you have to do if you're Jewish. But his experience was most of the people he met were secular. <laughs> yeah. he, and he was expecting this to be totally immersed in his faith, no, and he Israel, wasn't. It is, no, I mean, Israel is four main groups, 25% secular, 25% religious anti-state of Israel, Jewish, ultra-Orthodox, they think Zionism is the cause of all the sins and the problems of Israel. 25% Israeli Arab and 25% religious nationalist Zionist Orthodox Jews. 
Okay. So, so what's the difference go, between the Orthodox and and the, between the two groups of Jewish people? What's the, the difference right. there? The, so, so the ultra-Orthodox are anti-Zionism, anti the state of Israel. So, oh. so that's why right now in this time of challenge, you've got a big issue about whether or not they should be left to study Torah in the mid in the uh, yeshiva and get government support or if they should be on the battlefield and okay. so the orthodox ultra orthodox don't want their kids on the battlefield because of all the sins between the men and the women the interaction all of the issues which come up they don't want them there um they, i mean they are terrified of modern society for example some of them talk about you have to walk around you can't look <laughs> because of the beauty of the women. It, it, it's 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 a terrible challenge for the uh, Orthodox. Um, you can walk along the streets in Maya um, Sharim and you can see um, posters which say about how women who don't wear uh, long skirts, how they're going to be burning in hell from the up to the point where the knees are. So so you've got this communities incredibly devoted. For example, uh, I, I visited a really amazing city called Svat. It's four holy cities in Judaism, Jerusalem, Tiberias, Hebron, uh, Jerusalem because you know Jerusalem, King David, the, the Messiah, uh, Hebron because that's where King David was first crowned, Tiberias because that's where the Sanhedrin went after the temple was destroyed in the time of Jesus. The, the, the law court, the highest law court went over there, and Svat, which is the mystical city after Isabel and Ferdinand cast out all the Jews from Europe. Many really great mystics moved from Spain and headed over to uh, Svat. And that's where Kabbalah comes out of, this deep mystical tradition. It, it's all built up. It's not coming from there, but it's built up around there. So I went up there and... Um, and um, one guy was weighing up whether or not he wanted to be a Christian, which is very risky. He lost his wife as a result. But anyway, it's a very serious case. <laughs> so then um, I, I was walking the street one day, and, and I was hanging with the Orthodox. And when I tend to hang with the Orthodox, I tend to respect their culture, and I won't tell them, you need to repent and believe in Jesus. I'll just kind of hang and learn. But... Um, crazy story. I'm in a party with all these Orthodox Jews and, and all these young people who I discovered are exactly the same as, as normal young people in England. They're the same. They're all checking each other out, wondering who's going to be who with, with who. It's all the same, but they got all the regalia and they're praying so many hours a day. You're going to hear it in a second. So I, I accidentally spoke in tongues accidentally it just came out so a young man says to me what was that what was that and i looked at the guy who had invited me in and i'm thinking i shouldn't really disrespect the space but he seemed to give me the nod and so i said oh it's just a prayer language which we've been given to pray with you know Chaim. Wow, man, that's really cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. It, I mean, what we think of as being humble and putting away from ourselves among the yeshiva students, it's like you're saying you're a prophet. You know, we say, oh, it's not me. I didn't do it. It was the Lord. That's like saying you're a prophet in Jewish religious orthodox culture, you know? Right. And yeah. so... So, uh, so you know, we had a nice chat for about an hour afterwards, and you learn things. But in that city, I was walking along at night, and I was determined not to go into the synagogue like Jesus did, because Jesus literally sent me up to the city after Resurrection Sunday. So I was literally given a dream in, in Jerusalem, collect money and go. And I knew that it was to go up to the north and to Savat. So I get this dream, I get to the church, after the service, the lady comes to me, an African lady. She says, uh, the Lord told me to give you some money. Do you mind? I said, no. So she hands me the money under the table. 
<laughs> an American sister comes over and she takes me outside. She said, Anthony, you're very precious in the eyes of the Lord. And I've been thinking to bless someone before I go back to America and they're not here. Would you mind if I give you something? Yeah, go ahead. And then a Filipino sister also gave me something. So now I knew I had to go to the north after this Resurrection Sunday. God had given me the money. So I'm in the city. Uh, I had that little incident. I'm walking around at night. And there was a group of Breslovers. These go with a Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, a really great rabbi who I was studying because in a dream I was called Eddie Nachman. And when I discovered Rabbi Nachman in Israel, I just thought there's some connection here. So they said um, that I was walking along. There's like 10 of them, and there's me. And I'd already determined I'm not going to go in the synagogue and preach. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm trying to, yeah? And then they said, someone said to one of them, he's a missionary. That's the worst thing you can be in Israel, a missionary. Missionaries are respected in Africa. They are utterly despised in Israel. Right. The same with Islamic communities, but especially in Israel. He's a missionary. So then one of them started to go for me. He said, the Talmud says we can kill a guy and you're a guy. And the Talmud says this, and, and I'm, I'm feeling it. It's like I'm feeling it. And I'm thinking, man, if this is what I get for not preaching, and I used to be a turn and burn preacher, but you've seen the change in the book. If this is what I get for not preaching, I'll be darned if I'm not going to preach. So I said, you guys need to repent. They said, repent? We've been repenting all day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the atmosphere. I'm thinking, how can I talk to these people? They study Torah 18 hours a day. Study, study, study. In fact, if you follow the instructions of the rabbi from 1810 or so, you need 36 hours in the day to complete your obligations. Wow. If you studied, you know, and I'm thinking, how can I even talk to these guys? They're so dedicated, you know? And so then I said to them, you guys are supposed to be light. And then I pointed to the guy who said, we can kill a guy. I said, this is darkness. And I said, you guys are supposed to be this. This is something else. And then they said, anyway, why are you coming to spot? What are you doing here? I said, I came to study Rabbi Nachman. He was their rabbi. He's, he's from 200 years ago, but he's their rabbi. And so I told him about my dream with the name Nachman. And, and they said, we're giving him too much power. We're giving him too much power. And they all ran away. <laughs> Meaning they were giving you too much power. Because they were listening. Wow. Wow, and they're wow. very spiritual. And wow. when they hear spiritual experience, it really does make them think. When, as a Christian, I get up in a rabbi... Um, Rabbanic Shabbat meal, every Shabbat, you can go to a Rabbi Machlas, Jew, Christian, non-Jew, it doesn't matter, we all go, and anyone can share a word of encouragement, but we have to respect their tradition, so I can't get up and start talking about Jesus, but I can get up and start talking about the Psalms and what I learned today. So I would get up in the uh, community and, and, and the meal, and I would start sharing about what God had shown me that day, and then the young yeshiva students who were studying day and night, they would come to me, they would say, what's your secret? How do you get all that knowledge about the Psalms? I said, oh, it's not me, it's the Lord. That was a mistake. That makes you a prophet. <laughs> so so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful culture. I love the way the rabbis teach, except when they talk about Jesus. And, and I learned more about my faith in two years in Israel than I did in 30 years outside. <laughs> and also, one thing you discover when you come to Israel as a as an evangelist, you discover, oh, I'm the nations? Because you're always talking in England about, we're going to take the gospel to the nations. We're going to go. And the Jews say, you're a guy. You are a nation. We are the people. Oh, ah. <laughs> so you actually get a reorientation of who you are when you're living and you also learn so much about what, what do the Jews think that we Goyim should actually be doing with our lives in terms of obligations because obviously the Ten Commandments were given to them I was not standing at Mount Sinai they were yeah I'm Yahuwah, yeah. your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the house of slaves you shall have no other gods before my face you shall not make yourself 
who's standing who was brought out of egypt not me yes it was the jewish people yeah it was the people of israel who were brought out yeah. of egypt yeah so we have been blessed with receiving the wisdom and some of the commandments have become commandments for us but in actual fact the fascinating thing is this if you go through the ten commandments in hebrew and you look for the imperative form a command form you'll find it one time one time it's honor your father and mother honor your father and mother all the rest are the second person future looking a visionary future i you will be a society who does not steal from one another you will be a society that does not have to worry about someone trying to take your wife or you trying to take theirs you will be a society who does not cover after one another's possessions you will be a society and so when i do it with my kids i do uh, Yahuwah is our God, we have no other gods before his face, we'll not make for ourselves graven images of anything in the heavens above. We make it a confession. Instead of taking it out as commands, we will not steal, kidnap, or take anything that belongs to our neighbor. We love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We will not break the marriage covenant. We will love, we will not commit fornication, sodomy, bestiality, rape, incest. We love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So we make it into a confession because what the rabbis show you is that there's much more meaning in each word than you think when you normally say thou shalt not kill because thou shalt not kill actually says thou shalt not murder it doesn't say thou shalt not kill it says yeah. thou shalt not murder kill is another word altogether so you begin to learn the nuances when you are living among the rabbis and you begin to get a perspective which says why are we arguing about this we can love one another and disagree on this. This is not a big deal. Or many, many things come into context when you spend time. And obviously I spent a lot of time because first I was there for the seven years, then we got our first baby, then my wife wanted to come back to Norway to have the second child, to have her kids around, her family around. Yes. So after the seven years were up, we came here. Yeah. Then we were seven years in Norway, and then God started to give me dreams again to tell back to Israel. Just before that, how did you meet your wife in Israel? How do you yes. meet a Norwegian wife in Israel? Yeah. Was she so, Christian? Was you meet her through the church? It's it's fascinating. Um, so I told you, around October, I was studying. I was I was by this time I was a volunteer in a Christian Arabic bookshop, looking after the property by sleeping there. So I was a security, but I was also accounts, and and that's why I didn't have to pay rent. Right. You know, that was one of the answers to the question, how is God going to keep me here for seven years? I volunteered in this Christian Arabic bookshop. So what happened is around October, I started, uh, what happened is the Israeli authorities started getting concerned about this concerned Christians who was planning to do something on Temple Mount. And so what happened was a drastic thing. They walked into Anglican Christ Church arrested a young man and put him in prison, American. He'd never been inside a jail in his life. And the, the Anglican church had to raise 30,000 shekels bail to get the guy out. And he was only in there while his visa passport was in process. It was actually in process. So he wasn't really illegal, but you know, and so that happened and other things happened and I started getting afraid and I started thinking, oh, the police are everywhere. Because when you're a missionary, when you're an evangelist, you you are under the watchful eye of the rabbis, to, to, to put it that way. So when I get up in the middle of a, a Jewish talk on the disputation, in 1263 there was a disputation between Pablo Cristiani, a Roman Catholic, and Rabbi Nachmanides, a, a, a Jewish rabbi, in Barcelona, Spain. So I'm reading this book. It's very interesting. I'm expecting to agree more with the rabbi than the Roman Catholic, because I don't like all these graven images and stuff. So I'm expecting to agree more, but I didn't. I agreed more with the Pablo Cristiani. So then I'm reading this book, study it, and then suddenly I see a sign up, the disputation. There's a Jewish group who are gonna have a discussion about the disputation. 
And I'd been studying this, so I thought, okay, that'll be interesting. I go along, I get up one day, and I said to the whole group there, and, and just to give you an illustration of, of how they perceived me, at one point, people came up to me and they said, I don't agree with your theology, but your knowledge of Judaic is incredible. And that was only because I read stuff the day before or God gave it me the day before. It wasn't even like stuff I knew. I just, you know. So I got up and I said to them, what have we in Africa to do with the persecution of the Jews? A really crazy question, but I was using my blackness, my roots, 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 roots. And now I had a friend. She was converting to Judaism and she was walking with a rabbi. And she said one day, uh, yeah, yeah, she, because the Africans have suffered too. Because, you know, we suffered under the colonialists. And so it wasn't that we didn't turn away from Jesus because he suffered. Many of us turned to Jesus. So the excuse, if you want to call it excuse, whatever, it doesn't hold water when you compare it with the African situation. But anyway, he said to her when she said, yeah, because the Africans have suffered too, haven't they? He said to her, where did you hear that? <laughs> she said, oh, a friend of mine. He said, you know a very dangerous missionary. <laughs> straight away. Straight you away. Know? Worked you out straight away. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I heard that I and all this other stuff, I started getting really nervous. Well, if you've been labeled as a dangerous missionary, that's not a nice label to have at that time well, by it, the sound of things. In Israel, it's not the best thing to be labeled as. Uh, I wasn't really a missionary because I wasn't trying to convert Jews particularly. I was there because I was sent by the dream to help the charismatic church. That's that's why I was there. Mm -hmm. But the, the key point was this. I got so fearful and I started to sing every day, Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and now I know I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My savior, my precious friend or something. And I was singing over and over and over. And then I thought, Lord, is this my imagination or are there police everywhere? And I went out and there was Sister Irene from Bulgaria. She says, Anthony, the police are everywhere. <laughs> so I got so afraid that I literally left my job and they didn't want me to leave. And I put my luggage into a youth hostel because I knew this missionary knew me, right? I, I was thinking this, and I know we know all the people who are being deported and we know all the uh, Yad Lachim who are looking after all the uh, missionaries. So I literally packed my bags, put them in a hostel and headed down to Elat and chilled on the beach. After I went into Jordan, I thought, okay, so maybe the Lord wants me to be in Jordan. It's partly the Holy Land, isn't it? I mean, they, they, they had borders, you know? And I'm reasoning with myself. I'll set up an English teaching course over here. I'll set up an English school. But on coming up to Shabbat, the Holy Spirit said, go back. So I re-entered the land of Israel. And I discovered that the day I left, 500 Israeli police officers and soldiers went to every Christian nook and cranny, arrested people who had been there illegally for 18 years, deported them all. The people who I had lived up on the mountains with before, the, the house of David Branch Davidian, not, not, not actually David Koresh, but a, 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 relative, a relative, gone. They went in, they took little guy out from in St. Paul's who was sleeping in the bottom of St. Paul's. When they used to have, uh, they'd, they'd arrest somebody, put them in the prison, but the person wants to stay in Israel, right? More than most Jews. Most Jews are happy to be all over the world. Christians want to be in Israel. So he throws his passport away so they can't deport him. They, they did the research. They found out who he was, where he's from. Everyone... And that all happened and started the night I left. Wow. And were you yeah. there? You weren't there illegally, though, were no, you? No, no, I was legal. So they had still. no legal reason to, to, to get you no, out. No, but, but yeah. The, the point is this, right? Legal or not, if they think you're a missionary, they will talk to the Ministry of the Interior and get your visa revoked. Okay. Right. That has happened to many. In right. fact, the fact that I was sent for seven years 
and the fact that and and also I went back for five has made um the, the for example the administrator in the hebrew university Rothbard school when she saw my situation and compared it to the other she said so unfair some people have a perfectly organized application put everything in order and they go in and they are sent out of the country they have to come back in and get a visa me when i went to the ministry of interior they said I have never seen such a disorganized application. Go and organize the application. Bam, 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 bam. And I got switched from a student, to, from, a, from a, a tourist to a student on a three month, 10 hour Ulpan visa, which is unheard of. And she shook her head. She, so unfair. I, I saw it left, right, and center. Favor, you can't explain. Even at one point, this is the funny one of the funniest ones ever. We had a big mobile, a mobile home the second time round. Me, my wife, and five kids, we bought a car and we started driving towards Israel the second time round. So we arrive in Israel. We have to check in every six months. I got a little bit late one time. I knew I hadn't done anything wrong, but I was a little bit late. So Shlomo in the Ministry of uh, Transportation. He says, we have to do hikira, we have to do an investigation. Uh, because if you're late, they think that you're doing something with the vehicle, like trying to make money by selling it or something, you're not allowed to. So what happened is, I have to have a hikira, Shlomo says. So we're sitting there, Shlomo and me, and I know I haven't done anything wrong, and I know the Lord's with me. So he starts doing the hikira, name, da, da, da. the computer's going crazy. The computer's going crazy. The computer's going crazy. And you know, religious Jewish, they think spiritual. He goes out to his boss. He comes back. He says, we're not going to do anything this time, but don't do it again. Bye. Wow. <laughs> so so <laughs> I've seen things which you would not believe. So how do I meet my wife? Well, what happened is one day, I'm, is a, is a, I'm staying in the Al Arabiya hostel, very cheap. She was also in town. Christian manager, Muslim boss, Muslim owner. One day, the Muslim boss looks at me. He says, you, you, you look for trouble out of my hostel. Throw me out. I'm, I, I don't have anywhere to stay. I've got a lady who wants me to sleep in Bethlehem and be a slave and do her garden. That was a possibility. That was before the war, before the war. So she was having a blessed place right there on the, border and and then I, I i call it living by grace not faith because i had no idea what i was doing so i go down to the western wall a few days after i've been ca uh, cast out and i'm going to pray because it's a friday and uh gustavo the argentinian manager who's a christian he says uh why don't you come back and stay in the hostel he's the manager i said how can i come back and stay in the hostel i've just been kicked out <laughs> <laughs> his girlfriend had had dreamed about me before she came to the country so she was really impressed by me and so they said we'll pay for you i know that's right i said how can i come and stay in the hostel i've been kicked out and they said well yeah we've gone and spoken to uh, so and so and he's been doing things he's not so proud of and we told him you're a religious guy and you know you can come back i said well i've got no money <laughs> and they said, <laughs> they said, we'll pay for you. I said, okay, I'll think about it. So that night I slept in Bethlehem. I went back to the hostel to pick up my stuff the next day. And, and the where did you sleep in Bethlehem? Did you know someone there? There was a lady called Shaha who's an Aramaic speaking Christian. She wanted a slave to look after a garden. And oh, she, this is the, this is that. Oh, you stayed yeah. there with that lady. In okay, return, yeah. you would get yeah. a place to stay. Yeah, but I'm not a gardener. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not a long term solution. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I come back to the hostel. I pop in to get my luggage. And then the receptionist says, did you stay here last night? I said, no. He said, Gustavo paid for you. That made it clear where I was meant to be staying. I moved back into the hostel. And a few weeks later, my wife walks in the door. 
and Gustavo sees her. Now, I'm the guy who's going to church Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Anyone who wants a spiritual experience in Jerusalem is referred to me. So I'm just walking down and people just walking with me. So she's come walking with me and she's telling me what her plans are. And she's saying, oh, I'm going to go to Reform Jewish Kibbutz and this and that. And I was thinking, Reform Jewish Kibbutz, good Christian girl. What are you thinking? Because in those days, in my mind, the Reform Jewish Kibbutz was a den of iniquity. We heard stories about these kibbutz and what they got up to in these kibbutz. So I'm thinking, what's a good Christian girl <laughs> going there? So I asked her, why don't you try and stay in the church? It was Mount Zion Fellowship. They had a, it was a community of women mainly, and they people came and stayed and, and volunteered and, 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 you know, so why don't you consider staying in there? And so I said to her, she could hear dreams, and I said, why don't you uh, ask the Lord to see if you should stay in the church? She didn't feel comfortable to talk to the pastor. She didn't feel so comfortable with her. But in the night, she had a dream where the pastor welcomed her with a big smile. And so some of the people in the dream from the church were taking her to the hostel. So uh, after that, I was going to take her to the hostel. But I thought that's a little bit strange because in the dream, someone from the church was taking her to the hostel, one of the women. And if I'm taking this beautiful girl to the hostel, it's going to, I mean, to the church, people might be thinking. So as we walked out the hostel, the people from the church were walking past the hostel. So I just handed her over. And then they walked the 45 minutes to the church. She stayed there. Her direction changed. She never went to the kibbutz. She connected with Christians. She came back to the Lord. And then I asked her, could you ask the Lord to have a dream to see if we should be together. <laughs> it's within two weeks. Within two weeks. Could you ask the Lord, you know, to give you a dream? So she had a dream, but in the dream it just said, I look different with my glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> so I, she, she, and I was very cynical at that time. I was thinking typical Scandinavian, always looking over the shoulder for something better. That's what I started thinking in my crazy head. But I controlled myself, thanks be to God. I did not say anything. I did not act in a bad manner. And she left. But she was on my mailing list. Two years later... So she left Lord, back to... She went back to Norway. Yeah, she went back to Norway. She went over to Kenya. She almost got married in Kenya. She was gone for like two years. All right. She didn't just leave she town. She properly left. Yeah. Yeah, she didn't leave in any bad way. She just finished right. her six weeks and, and just left, yeah. you know. Uh, and thankfully, I controlled myself to that degree. Thankfully, now I would think even higher level of control. But in those days, to control was better than not to control. And so um, after a couple of years, the Lord finally gave me permission to come to Europe. When I wanted to go the year before, it was a no, because I was living by cash, no cards. Everything had to be cash. If the Lord didn't give me $55 to pay for my university application, no university for me. I wasn't going to go and ask people for money. I just wouldn't do it. So um, finally, after two years, it gave me freedom to come to Europe for a visit. I sent out an email to everyone. I'm coming to Europe. Anyone want an audience, please? And she responded. And she said, uh, you could come to Norway and we could have a good time and talk. We, I came to Norway, we talked together, and we said, we'll try to be together. This is two years later. And so um, she came on the February in 2002, and we married on July 8th, 2002. Wow. And we, we married in St. Andrew's Church of Scotland, which is right, beautiful church right over from Jaffa Gate, Jerusalem. Over Mount Zion's there, hills right down below, Gehinnom Valley is right below us. Zion's over there, and we married there. And then, as I said, we had our first kid in Bethlehem, September the next year. Uh, and we had a, 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 the witnesses for our wedding were an, a bishop, Metropolitan, from a Catholicus, not Roman Catholic, but Catholicus, from the Holy and Apostolic Church of the East, which goes all the way back to India and Thomas in India. And so he was the witness, along with his wife, and then we were married by Clarence, I think it was Clarence Rogers, who was the pastor of the St. Andrew's 
Church of Scotland, you know, over there. So mm -hmm. that's how we met and that's how we married. And by the grace of God, that's how we are together. And that's why you're in Norway today, speaking to me from Norway. Exactly. Because, um, right. yeah. Okay. So, well, let's move on and talk about the book then. Okay. Because the book was a lot of fun to do. Uh, the Inspirational Teachings of Bethel. Bethel is a church in the United States. How does that work in? Did you did you go, you know, because we've got we've got the the Middle East and we've got Scandinavia and a bit of Europe. How did you end up in the USA? Right. So it's a, it's a, again a fascinating story. Um, there is a I, we we when I'm in a culture, I tend to uh, go with that culture. So Norway is a Lutheran culture. So I'm a Lutheran. I was attending a Lutheran church. All my kids got baptized. I baptized my kid in the Catholicus in Israel, one of them, the first one. The rest got baptized here in Lutheran churches. And one of the Lutheran ministers got excited about this church in Redding, California. Um, he was so excited, he was organizing a trip to go there with a team of the youth. And he was given a whole bunch of money to take the youth on a trip over to this church. Um, I'd asked him, if you've got any extra money, I'm not really a youth, but if you've got any extra money, you know, <laughs> I'd love to go. He never came back to me. So I just decided, I think I will go to Bethel by faith. I didn't know what it was particularly, but I knew that they had a new method of evangelism called treasure hunting. And treasure hunting means when you go out to evangelize, you're going to look for the gold inside people, the treasure, and the people are the treasures. Whereas when I used to evangelize, it's turn or burn. So okay. yeah, I'm, I'm turn a or burn. Street okay. preacher. Okay, right, right. <laughs> and so there's, there's this new method. I thought, well, I'm an evangelist. If there's a new method of evangelism, I should know about it. And what better way to know about it than at the horse's mouth? I'm going to go by faith. So when now the pastor had not come back to me about the idea, he rang me and asked me if I'd be willing to cover the youth meeting while he was away. And I said, uh, no, I can't do that. Uh, why not? I'm going to America. <laughs> And this is an act of faith. To turn him down is an act of faith because you're saying to God, I do not doubt but that I am going. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't know how. But by telling him, no, I can't do that, I'm saying, yes, I'm planning to be over there. That, see, one of the things I struggled with over the years was, how do you know you're not doubting? Jesus said, have the faith. Everyone says he said, have the faith in God. Whosoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is coming to pass, he shall have whatever he says. But it doesn't say in God. It says have the faith of God. In other words, the God who says light there be light and knows there will be light. That's the kind of faith we're supposed to have when we say things. But I always used to ask the question, how do you know you're not doubting? If I had said to him, maybe... That would demonstrate I'm doubting. So I had to say, no, I'm going to America. And so what happened in that particular trip, I was praying for the funds and people knew I was going to America now. I'm telling people. But you've I'm not praying. got the money or anything. You have, you've got no idea how you're going to get there. I don't know how I'm going to get there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm praying uh and we're reaching the date of the prophetic conference and we're getting closer and so i gave a tongues and an interpretation to myself at the bus stop in a little town so tongues fear not my son i'm i'm fear not my son i will make a way for you to california i'll be with you um i will make a way for you in that place you'll be my servant you'll accomplish my purpose make your hands ready i recorded the prophecy in my phone and then every time I listened to it, my spirit said, woo, 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 woo. I said that, woo. So make your hands ready. You will accomplish my purpose. You'll be my servant. Make your hands ready. So I figured make your hands ready. That basically means 
pack your bags ahead of time so that you're ready to go. So I have my bags packed, I'm praying and there's no money. Now, if I want to be in America on the February the 22nd, and I reach to February the 22nd here, waiting, praying, I have no faith. Because you can't fly from your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> you can't fly from your bedroom. So I says to my wife, you know, I think I need to go to Oslo by faith. I and mean, she said she agreed. She was feeling sorry for me at this point because, you know, you're praying and there's no money and nothing's happening. So she agreed. So I got my bags. I headed to Oslo. I rang my friend from Africa. I've been inviting African preachers over here and, and guaranteeing them to combine the wisdom of the Norwegian church, which is able to, to deliver the faith for, forward and the fire of the Africans. I said, we need one another, oh, you know, so I, I'm doing that. I ring my brother from Africa. I say, do you know anyone in Oslo? Because I don't. <laughs> he, he has grace. Wherever he goes, he meets people. So he tells me about an African preacher, gives me the number. So I'm heading to Oslo. I meet the African preacher. He says, so you're going to America? Yeah. So do you know where your money is coming from? I said, no. He said, uh, you, do you have any like expectation of an income? Like uh, you got a job? And, and some, uh, No. But I do have a word. Fear not. I will make a way for you to California. I will make a way for you in that place. You'll be my servant. You'll accomplish my purpose. So he looked at me. He said, go back. Go back to your wife. He did not believe. In fact, he thought I had marital problems. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're sitting in the car. And um, he said, look, I work with Iceland Television Gospel Channel. And it's a pity because maybe you could have ministered on the gospel channel. God could touch somebody, give you the money, and and uh, but you know I can't. I I I've, I'm not going to gospel channel tonight, and I've got to go back to my wife. He said. Ten minutes later, in the car, the phone rings. It's gospel channel. We need a guest. <laughs> <laughs> He drops me at Gospel Channel. He goes home to his wife because he had to, and I ministered on Gospel Channel. But it wasn't. Had live. you ever done it on TV before? No, and it was uh, in Norwegian, and it wasn't live. Okay. <laughs> so I was just sharing in Norwegian, and and so in the morning I'm thinking maybe the guy, the other evangelist who's interviewing me, maybe he's going to bless me. So I'm waiting in the morning, and it goes 9, 10. I woke up at 6.25. 7, 8, 9, uh, uh, 10. I said, this guy's not waking up. And then I thought, if you are going to be moving to America, you can't be doing it from here. So I left. I went to Kaliahan, the main street in Oslo. I began to give out tracks. It was freezing cold. It was winter. I'm just giving out tracks. And then a lady or a young lady. What, you're uh, giving out what, what tracks? Tracks, gospel tracks, little messages okay. about Jesus. Okay. Just handing them out right. on the street. Because you see, Jesus said, when you go to the disciples, when you go on a mission, don't take your purse. Leave your wallet at home. No gold, no silver. My 21st century interpretation what is, when you go on a mission, I'm responsible for the cost. So that's my interpretation of that message to the disciples. When we go on a mission, so once I leave my house, I'm on a mission. And now God's responsible for the cost. So I'm giving out the tracks, doing missionary work, but in Oslo, but I'm on a mission. A young lady stops from the theological faculty and she just asked me a question and another question. Then we had a conversation. Then she invited me to lunch. So we're going to lunch. Uh, I get a phone call from my African brother. He said, did anything happen? Did anything happen? I said, no, but uh, he said, I'm sorry. I have nowhere for you to stay tonight. I have nowhere to accommodate you tonight. I said, don't worry, brother. You're not, I'm not dependent on you and you're not responsible for me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So the sister who was there with me, she had a friend called John and she rang him and asked if I could stay with him. And he was so excited. He always wanted someone from Africa. 
black skin is Africa in these cultures. <laughs> <laughs> he always wanted to connect with something from Africa. So he invited me. And then, and then I discovered when I'm talking with these two, that they knew the very people I was going to connect with these young people from our church in America. These guys went to the same school as them. So they knew. So I woke in the morning and I thought, this is a lot of grace. This is grace like the grace of uh, the servant of Abraham when he was looking for a wife for Isaac. He went and he asked, Lord, can the one who gives me water and says, I'll give water to your camels as well. Let that be the one who is going to be the wife of Isaac. So I thought, this is like that. So I said to John, would you be willing to support the mission? He says, yes, I would love to. And it shouldn't take long because we are so many Christians. So I'm with Lutherans. They're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're not charismatic, but they love the Lord. Him and her, they bought my ticket. His roommates, They bought your ticket? And his wow. roommates put money in my account, which I used to hire a car so that when I arrived in America, <laughs> I was driving along the I-505. I will make a way for you to California. I will make a way for you in that place. When I got there, I'm in the back of the church. I tell the story to a lady as to how I got there. She says, wow, you need to go to this meeting, that meeting, that meeting. You can go to that one with my husband, that one with my brother. So I got into all these private meetings, which you wouldn't normally get into. I'll make a way for you in that place. I went on a first treasure hunt. And when I was out afterwards, a guy comes up to me and says, if you have somewhere to eat tonight? I said, well, no, nowhere specific. He said, uh, me and my wife would like to invite you for dinner. I said, oh, thank you. So we went to the Red Lobster, which I would never go to of my own resources because I don't have that kind of resources. And then after we'd been talking and eating, they said, we want a part of what God's doing. Do you have a hotel in mind? So it just so happened that the night before I'd arrived and I'd looked at a hotel, it was a smoking place. And the woman said, if you want a room with Wi-Fi, you have to pay extra and all the rooms are smoking rooms. I said, this is not my divine appointment. <laughs> <laughs> so I left that hotel. I went to a big, nice Red Lion Hotel across the road. And I, I asked the receptionist, it was really nice. Do you know, is there a hotel around here for $20 for a night or something, you know? Because I could sit relaxed in this nice hotel. And so I'm sitting there with my computer. And then she says, I think I should help you. I think I should help you. She knew I was going to Bethel. I think I should help you. I think I should help you. So what she did, she rang a $40 hotel down the road because she was a $100 hotel. She rang a $40 hotel down the road, booked me a space. And then when I went, I slept in the $40 hotel. And when I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, I arrived at, after midnight. I ate dinner at Dennis at 3 in the morning. I go to sleep. I wake up 6.37 or I wake up 8, whatever. There is coupons there, $40 for her hotel. She went home some 6 o'clock in the morning, whenever, took the coupons, dropped them at the other hotel, and there they were in the morning. So when he asked me, do you have a hotel in mind? I said, well, these $40 coupons for the Red Lion. $40 for the Red Lion? That's not bad. So they took me to the hotel and booked six days with breakfast. For wow. me in that hotel. Wow. I will make a way for you in that place. So so it happened. And and so it was like quite astonishing. And that is the beginning of the time with Bethel. Uh and you know, it's exciting stuff. Now, that was just a week. It was kind of in my heart, wouldn't it be great to do a, a year? But I forgot about it, and I uh, went back to, what year was that? That was 2011. The next year, I went back for a short course on the culture of honor with Danny Silk. That was really amazing. A uh, little kid, they brought the young kids in to prophesy over us adults who were visiting. And um, uh, one little kid pointed at me, first guy he pointed to in, in the group. He said, you're going down in history. <laughs> Yeah, that was a nice word. You're going down in history. You have creative ways of sharing the gospel. You have creative ways. Yeah, that's what I do. 
I share the gospel creatively. He was reading my book and giving me revelation of myself. And so that was 2013. And then in the later on in 2013, the Lord began to give me dreams telling me to go back to Israel. I said, Lord, if you want us to go back to Israel, you're going to have to talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to live in Norway. The, the, the resources are flowing. But when you live in Israel, you don't know where the next corona is coming from. I don't, I don't like writing lots of letters to lots of people asking for lots of money. Mm. You know, that someone said, William Booth, I think it was said, if Moses has had to go to a committee, he would never have crossed the Red Sea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so basically what happened when we were now in Israel, we did five years. And then at the end of five years, I had my second master's. I got my first master's the first seven years. That's how God gave me uh, visas through study. So I got a master's in New Testament the first time around. Second time around, I went to not a Christian university like the first time, but Hebrew university, and I did a master's in Old Testament, Tanakh. And so I got that the second time around. And so now, at the end of the five years, we were feeling, okay, I think it's time to go. But I was thinking, we're not ready to go back to Norway. Our, our, our relationships, I was too strict with the kids. We're not ready to go back to Norway. So I'm praying about America. And so I said to the kids, who wants to go to America? And they all said, yeah. And everyone's dem democratic in Norway. So my wife had to go with it, even though she wasn't sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was looking at Dallas Theological Seminary. That almost gave me a headache looking at their requirements for their doctorate. And I was looking at Oral Roberts University, and I also got a headache. And, and, then, and then a lady came to me, and she was asking me about going to study in Bethel. So I was giving her advice, how, how great it was, and how she should go and everything, you know? And she didn't go, and I did. <laughs> so that's how he came across me. Threw you talked yourself out. into it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's how it came up, I thought, because they, 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 you see, I want to learn ways of good character, but it has to be biblical. Mm -hmm. So I can't just get it from secular science. I have to get it somehow incorporated in the Bible. And that's why Bethel's special, because they are taking uh, boundaries. For example, they will look at the New Age and they'll say, it's not all evil. They're, there's something they have which we can learn. You can learn. Jesus said, be wise as serpents. So obviously the serpent is not considered to be a good animal, but Jesus says, be wise as serpents innocent as doves. Behold, I send you out as sheep among wolves. How crazy is that? You're going out as sheep among wolves. Who's going to protect you? You know? And so Bethel is so wise in that it tries to understand what is it that they are pointing at, New Ages, whoever, which we can learn, which we have lost, which the church once had, but now the church has lost because it's got so, you know? And and they teach character, self-control. So I thought, that's the place. So I said to the kids, every box you pack is a step of faith. Because we didn't even have the money to leave Israel. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, this is the funny thing, right? We stayed in Haifa for the last week in a free hotel. And we looked at our financial situation and the flight prices. We're not going anywhere. So we asked them for some extra time. They gave us an extra five days. At the end of the extra five days, we looked at the flight prices and our resources. No, we're not. But me, my wife, and my big son, who was probably, I don't know, 14 or 15 at the time. We can't ask for more time. And this is the first time I ever did it, probably the only time I ever did it. I would have to go with my family to the airport by faith. I've done it myself. You already saw, I went to Oslo, but the next time I could go to the airport. When the airport didn't give me the ticket, I just went back to my mate's house. But I said, maybe God will talk to somebody and give me a ticket, and I have to demonstrate I'm going to go. And the only way you can demonstrate you're going to go is by going to the airport. 
It didn't work out, but you demonstrated faith. So, so in the same it's, way, it's quite literally a leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I also have another saying: when you're in the air, you can't go back. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm going to go to Kerala in the south of India, and I can only afford a ticket to New Delhi, I'm flying. Yeah. <laughs> Once you're in the air, you can't go back. <laughs> yeah. That's another way of faith. Same with Memphis. I just headed off to Memphis. It took an hour, a long way to get there, but I got there in time for the pro I had to do a presentation to the National Professors of the Association of Hebrew. And 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 my lecturer had said, if you come and do a presentation, I'll give you 10% on your grade. I thought, well, that would be fun. I think I'll go there by faith. <laughs> so, so what happened literally was we heading towards the airport, planning to sleep there. As we entered the airport, a guy calls me and he asks permission to fight for the right to keep our vehicle in Israel. In other words, I had to give him, what do you call it? Right of, where I give him max power, authority over the vehicle. Oh, uh, power of attorney or something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, something yeah. like that, where I yeah. give him the authority. So yeah. he wants to give me $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> So we didn't sleep in the airport. We slept in his house. And he was off for the weekend. We booked tickets with the money he gave us, and then we flew. And then my wife and kids started moving from house to house for the next six weeks. And I waited in Oslo till I had money to get to America. When I got the money to get a flight to America, I flew off. I got to the Reading. I thought I was going to arrive in a town with a bus station with an insight so that I could stay five, six in the morning in the bus station. Yeah. There was no inside bus station. So you land in, where did you land in California then? LA or Cal we landed San Francisco? In, um, San Francisco, I believe. San Francisco. And where, how far is Bethel from San Francisco then? I think it's, it's like Reading. Five and six hours, three, th between three and five hours. What, north or south? Probably north. So on the way to Oregon, so that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and 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 so I arrived really early in the morning. So how did yeah, you get? Yeah. How did you get that? How did you make that trip? Was that literally a bus? Yeah, that would have right. been a bus, not yeah. a no train. That's a bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I arrive on a Greyhound bus, and thankfully, I had strategized. I had talked to a guy beforehand to see if he could try and find accommodation. And I'd sent him money, blessed him with my tithe, so that I had a connection in town. And he was he came and picked me up. He didn't like me as much in the flesh, so he just dropped me off, and that was the end of that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he dropped me at the 24-hour prayer house. So... I put my luggage under the cushion so that no one knew I was homeless. No one knew I had nowhere to stay. My luggage was there. And then I just chilled in the prayer house, taking coffee, you know. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, a sister who knew me from Israel and followed my missions on Facebook, because I put my missions on Facebook. She turns up at four o'clock in the afternoon. I only knew her from a prayer tower in Jerusalem where I used to play a little twinkling and, and sing a little bit. And, and people would come two or three at a time, you know, and, and she knew me from that. And she saw on Facebook that I was coming to Reading and she happened to be in Reading. Four o'clock, she turns up, she said, the Lord told me to be your wheels. She picked me up. I got my stuff. I didn't know she was, maybe I knew she was coming because she told me on the Facebook. I can't remember, but she picked me up. She took me to the hotel. She dropped me, paid for the hotel. and And that was my first night. And then it's like I was giving a letter the next day. I had arrived on September the 14th. The letter said, you have until September the 24th as an international student to pay the rest of your $5,000 There were 3,614 outstanding. Or you may have to uh, withdraw from the course because international students don't have the rights like American ones to pay over time. They have to pay everything in advance. So I had 10 days to get 
But there was one light in the tunnel. She, they said September the 24th. That means it's the 24th of the ninth month. In 2014, the Lord said to my family, when we were praying in September, from the 24th of the ninth month, from this day, I will bless you. That was from opening the Bible after prayer. And it happened to be September. And so we thought, okay, is he talking about the Jewish calendar or the our calendar? We don't know. But we did know on the 24th of September because Australians sent $2,000 into my account on that day. So I knew... Wait, wait, wait how, where, how, where the Australians come into this? How do they they suddenly funding okay. this? So in 2011, I had sat down in the library here in a, a little town, and I said, okay, I can't get jobs teaching in school so much so easily here. So God has told me, he'd given me uh, the advice, you're an evangelist. The, a prophet came up to me in 1991 in speaker's corner in london and said are you going to be the lord's evangelist i answered yes he says he's anointed you to da, 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 da. so uh i said okay so i've got career advice from the year uh, creator of the universe so uh let's act on it right this year i'm going to preach the gospel to the ends of the world in four directions jerusalem shanghai cape town tromso north of norway stavanger west of norway that was the ends of the world if you follow your finger to the sea so God granted that. That same year, that was 2011, I didn't just go to Shanghai and Cape Town and these other places, but I also went, that story with the Bethel one, I went from uh, Los Angeles, I mean, New York to Los Angeles, because there was a cheap ticket to Los New York, so I went by faith and then, you know, and I went also lands into John I, I did all these places that year. The next year I said, okay, this year I'm going to preach the gospel beyond the ends of the world. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most exciting ever. So so I'm I'm on the mission to the usual mission to Kenya in August. And then I'm planning I can't go to Australia again in November because Mona's is gonna have a baby. So I have to do the Africa Australia mission back to back. That means I will not return to Norway. I was thinking, shall I go back to Norway and God touch somebody and then they give me the money and then I go to Australia? That's not faith. So I just stopped in Paris and waited. And then I have to decide, how am I going to get all the way to Australia? You have to bounce. You have to bounce. So I had a dream. I'm turning Japanese. I think I'm turning Japanese. I really think so. <laughs> da, 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 da. You know that. Most people do not know that song. <laughs> the it's Vapors. It was by the Vapors turning was it Japanese. By the Vapors, by the vapors Just think yeah. I thought it was Depeche Mode. That's no, it was crazy. the Vapors. I played it on the radio. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's the song which came to me. So I knew, okay, I'm going to go via Japan. And then, uh, when I was in Kenya, a brother said, uh, I have a brother-in-law in, in uh, Perth. Uh, maybe you can visit him. So the next day he says, I talked to my brother-in-law. He will not be there when you are there. So I said, well, can you give me the address? And no, I don't think it's protocol, good protocol, to go to a church when a man is not at home. So he refused to give me the uh, name of the church. But I had a dream the same night that I was in Perth. So I knew I was going Perth. And so I flew, I went to Japan. There was a sister in Australia who followed my missions on Facebook. Never met her, but she followed the missions. And she made a vow. She said, Lord, I'm going to help one of his missions. So now she made that vow. And the next day she disappeared from Facebook. And she disappeared for six weeks. And I thought, her husband said, you're not giving any money to some <laughs> strange guy on Facebook. So what happens is I'm in Japan. I'm on the last night in Japan. I'm in a hotel with a little cubicle. Oh, the capsule hotel. Yeah, yeah. I'm in a capsule hotel because, you know, one thing you can't do by faith is go to the wrong airport and get where you're going. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that's what I did. I went to the wrong airport in Japan and I couldn't fly from there. And therefore, by the time I got back, it was midnight. My hostel was full. I said, I saw a guy sleeping at the bus stop. I said, if God is not with me, me, I'm going to be sleeping at the bus stop tonight. 
But the hostel told me about the capsule hotel. And I went to the capsule hotel. It was cheaper than the hostel. So I went into the capsule hotel. I'm on Facebook on the capsule hotel. And bam, after six weeks, this lady appears again. I run to her and said, that's amazing. I'm in Japan and I'm about to come to Australia and you appear back on. So because she saw the divine orchestration in this whole coincidence, she doubled what she was planning to give from $200 to $400, which covered my flight to Australia from Japan. Right. One way. So I arrive in Australia. I go down to her. She's a Vietnamese sister. I sleep in her house in a tent in the living room. Her dad's there, her mom's there, her husband's there, kids. I'm in the living room and I'm in the tent. And I ministered in the Baptist, uh, uh, little Baptist church there, the Vietnamese Baptist church. I ministered to her church. A brother was really excited. He said, is he going to Perth? Is he going to Perth? If he hasn't got the money to go to Perth, I'll pay for the money. I'll pay for the ticket to Perth. So so, so you're in I, Sydney at this stage then? You're, yeah. Is that, yeah. I went into Gold Coast, down to Sydney. Okay, so yeah. notice I'm on one coast. Yeah. This is not my plan, but... Because Perth's a long way. I think it's Perth. like a five-hour flight to Perth. It's a long, long way for those it's who don't know the other geography. End of the country. So yeah. the Lord took me to the ends of the Australian world, <laughs> and I wasn't even planning it. <laughs> and so so he pays. He has to pay 489 or 479 instead of 289 because the next day my flight is heading back to Japan. So I'm in Perth. I'm with a Vietnamese pastor. We're walking around. We're evangelizing. We talk to a guy and we talk to this. And then the end, I'm sitting on the computer trying to work out how to get to Japan. I don't have enough money. The Vietnamese pastor is feeling the pressure. He feels like I'm expecting him to give me the money. So he's on my shoulder. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so I got permission from my wife. I said, well, I haven't got enough to get to Japan. The flight left without me. But I have got enough to get to Darwin, which is where I really wanted to get to. I had a dream in 2002 about some win to do with Australia. And that was one of the reasons for this mission to go to this win place. So uh, the, mi the mission now was like 40 days because, uh, you know, it's all by faith. So you don't know how long it's going to take each step. I book my time in Darwin. I start, I go to Darwin. I can stay in a hostel. I didn't have enough to get to Japan, but I had enough to get to Darwin and I had enough to be in Darwin. So after about seven days, I said, okay. I don't have enough for the hostel anymore. So I guess tomorrow night I need to sleep in the uh, airport. And I said, mm, if God is not with me, I better get myself a job in one of those hostels. Because I went into the flight center. I said, I better find out how much this ticket's going to be. I went into the hostel, I mean, into the flight center. And the lady said, about $1,000, $1,240, So I came out of the shop. I bought a delicious cake because I'm not saving for a ticket. God will give me the ticket when he's ready. So I, I bought a delicious cake, lime and something rather. A couple of hours later, I get on a bus and uh, I think I want to go to that spot on the map. I, I look at maps and I think I want to go and see what that is. So I start talking to a lady on the bus and um, turns out she's a sister in the Lord. And so I said, where do you work? And she goes, me? I work at Flight Center. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Are you the lady who gave me the price for the ticket? Okay, I believe in divine appointments, I say. I believe God's going to give me money to get back to Norway. And when he does, I'm going to buy the ticket from you. So she wants to invite me to visit her dad, visit her house. This is after, you know, 10 minutes on the bus talking. Um, we had even talked about race. I'd said to her, uh, I said to her, what was it? I said, you have a problem here in Darwin. It's an open, spacious city, but you have many Aborigines just out of their heads on the sides of the street. And and um, and it's it feels like there's some kind of cursing operation, I said. And she goes, well, aren't all black people under a curse? And I said, have you been to Kenya? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you should go to Kenya before you say that. Because actually, when I grew up in England, I thought we were under a curse. But when I went to Kenya, bam, no curse. I understood. We're not under any curse. But it took Kenya to blow my mind and to take it away. So so then I, then she invited me to dinner. Uh, I couldn't go that night because an Indonesian guy wanted to take me to the Chinese restaurant because I'd ministered to the some, some Bible study. 
So the next night when I'm going to be sleeping in the hostel, I'm sitting having a steak with this sister and her dad in their house. And the steak was important because I'd been looking at $10 steaks thinking, if only I had $10. If only I had $10. Now I'm probably eating a $30 steak in this house. So then what happens is we're, we're talking and then she said something really bad about her granddad. And I said to the man of the house, we've been an hour together, hour and a half. So they're Australians, we're friends now. I says, does your wife talk about her dad like that? And they said, yeah. And I said, didn't he do anything right? And they said, nah. I said, nothing? And they said, well, come to think of it. He did try and do this and he tried to do that. I said, because the Bible says, honor your father and mother. And I say, if you've got nothing to good to say about your parents, don't say anything at all. He said, what do you need? I said, me, I need a ticket home. He said, we'll do that and <laughs> bought me a ticket from Australia to Norway. And those Australians supported all my missions for the next six years. So they paid for the American adventure in California. They paid for the $12,000 Hebrew University master wow. degree. Wow. And, wow. and it was one family. For normally, normally the, the, the dad gave me $6,000 at a time. But then when I needed to pay 5,593 American for the scholarship fees, and I went to the school university and I said, is it possible to delay the payment? I'd, I'd missed every payment, but I'd paid a bit from what he gave, uh, to delay it to February the 20th. They said, everybody who's been given permission to delay the payment has got February 1st as a deadline. I said, okay. So normally he put $6,000 in my account. This time he put $10,000 in my account, Australian, which means like 9,000 American. And I asked him, so where did the extra 4,000 come from? He said, his son, I had counseled his son his son was marrying an Aborigine Indian, and there was a lot of conflict around it. And they had been fornicating at the beginning. And when they were married, she had got violent and started hitting him. Each time he would call the police, he wouldn't fight back, he would call the police. And then the third time they said to her, if this continues, you are gonna have to go behind bars. They warned her. She got an apocalypse as yes as Christus. She had a revelation of Jesus Christ. She gave her life to Jesus. And so what happened is Christmas time comes and I see they're around. So I contact them and say, hi. And there she is with her husband. They now had a normal Christian marriage with normal problems. And he wanted to give thanks to God for the blessing because I prayed with them and given them a word and given them scripture and he wanted to give thanks. So he put $4,000. His dad put 6,000 together. It was 10,000. I pay the school. I pay the rent. I pay the tithe. Gone. And that's <laughs> <laughs> so those Australians on 2014, 24th of September, they had sent $2,000. Remember I met them for two hours. That was it. Two, three wow. hours, one night. Wow. One night. And then the year after 2015, we reached October the 8th and we were really struggling for milk and bread. And my wife says, what's going on? I said, I don't know, but we have to remain thankful. So I had an Israeli account, which only the Australians put into, and they told me when they put in. And I can't get to it online. It's so complicated. All these Hebrew stuff, I couldn't get to it. So we reached October the 8th, things are really hard. I sent a message to the Australians and said, um, please pray for us. They said, well, we know what we gave was not very much, but maybe we need to think about tent making. I said, did you give something? I said, yeah, on the 24th of September, $3,000 was transferred to your account. 24th of the ninth month, 2014 and 2015, then he did something in 2016. 2016, my, my academic work on academia.edu. Suddenly, people started reading my, my work. Before, it was like this. And then 24th of September, I top 2% researcher. Nobody was interested <laughs> till the 24th. 
So when Bethel told me, you have until the 24th of the ninth month, the day the foundation of the temple was laid, this is from the book of Haggai. God says, from this day, I will bless you. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> On the 23rd, I owe $2,600 still from the three nine. On the 23rd, somebody anonymous put $500 to cover some of my college fees. On the 24th, I'm sitting around with these ladies and we're saying, well, you know, the Lord did say from the 24th. He didn't say on the 24th. He said from the 24th. And we were talking. I went to bed. I woke up at five in the morning, four in the morning. I go to check my account, how much I owe. Someone put $2,100 in at 10.46 p.m. Jesus loves you very much. Your days in the future are better than days in the past. Enjoy him. Zero old. And that made my wife say, we're going to America. Because <laughs> she was still in Norway, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's, you know, that's how and I so, ended up uh, entering battle. And so in your book, which is... It's a kind of a book review, but there's a lot of you in it too. You delve into the teachings of Bethel. How did you choose which teachings to include in your book, Inspirational Teachings of Bethel? I basically had eight book reviews. Now, I did leave out a couple of books, and I'm not sure we did reviews on them. So basically, I understood these teachings have blessed my family. And they have connected me back to my dad. Now, I, I'm Jamaican background. Jamaican background, you, you kids, you listen. You listen. And that meant distance. So when I was 18, I escaped to university. I was thinking either we're going to clash or I get good grades and I get out of here. My dad understood that. But yeah. I didn't say that to anyone, but that was my plan. So I... I found it, I kept distance from my background, but through the culture of honor, which is prevalent in Bethel, uh, it's an honor culture whereby it's opposite to what you think of when you think of honor culture, you see? Honor culture is usually you think they're gonna kill the woman for making a mistake, mm -hmm. but the culture of honor is the opposite. We're looking for the honorable things we can say about you and about what you're doing and who you are. So you are thinking, oh, your dad, he didn't want to hurt you. He didn't know better, in, in fact. And, in a, in, and this is a, the case with so many people. They're acting a certain manner not because they want to be hurtful, but because they don't know how to do it a different way. And this is the problem with uh, habits. You develop a habit, it becomes a prison. You might not even know it's a prison, but every time this set of circumstances come up, you react in that way. And therefore, if you react in that way against me, you are not being personal. It might feel by the words you're speaking that it's personal, but you would have done it to someone else in the same context if, if, if the same circumstances had arisen. Therefore, it is not personal, it is habitual. Now, once you've understood things are habitual, then obviously you don't take it personally, so you can forgive them forever. Because you're thinking just like Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, and so what happens is I come back from Bethel. The first thing that changes is instead of going up to my kids and saying, hey, guys, I told you yesterday, you shouldn't bring your dishes in the bedroom and you should clear it up and look, here it is, here it is. And they said, I said, take it down. But we're playing that. Yeah, but I told you that yesterday and I told you that the day before. If I had understood, there's a habit, but I didn't understand. So I would maybe force them to take the dishes right now down. But I began to realize, oh, we have to work from connection. And if I force them to take the dishes down, it causes distance. It doesn't cause us to be closer. And remember, I'm working within the limitations of who I am. So I'm not these American ideal families, which have this amazing ideal families. I'm just me. 
And so I go up to the room and I say, can I take your dishes for you? Yeah. Oh, oh. Take the dishes. You've connected. You're in a better relationship. And gradually you are building relationship. And it means that when they're 18, they're not going to run away. They're not going to want to disappear because you're letting them be empowered and you are I'm supporting them. So this is what changed. Now, another way that works out is this. I understood when I do bad stuff, raise my voice or get angry, don't be surprised when your kids raise their voice, when they get angry. In other words, they do what you do, not what you say. And I was one of the main guys in the world writing my poems back in the 1980s who was saying, how come adults do the same th mistakes as kids, but the kids are not allowed to do it, but the adults punish the kids for doing it, and then they do it. I was one of the main guys writing this, you know. So I understood, even if my kids don't do what I want them to do now, if I do the right thing in front of them, at some point they will begin to do it. Because I saw them do bad things, which I did. So for sure, they will do the good things. So you build on connection, not on being right. And there's only one fruit of the Spirit in the New Testament to do with control. And that's self-control. <laughs> <laughs> So, so basically, most of those book reports was were the ones I'd written, and yeah. the policy was explain what the writer wanted to say. So you'd already written the book reports when you, and then basically what you, um, you you put the book together from the reports you'd already got. Is that how it worked? Yeah, most yeah. of my books, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because I like reality. Yeah, it was the same with my newsletters. Sometimes when I went on missions. I went on those missions. I didn't, I just put the newsletters together. Why? Because that's how it worked. It worked. I mean, it's not perfect. It's not grammatically brilliant. It's not the, it's not, but it worked, right? People don't understand. People are so fixated with perfection in grammar. For example, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm glad that you did this because together <laughs> we could create a perfectly grammatical book. It, it makes it much easier to to promote because I'm not ashamed of misspelling the word learn L E A N R on the second page. You know, it doesn't matter so, in an audio book how you spell it as long as it looks, exactly. <laughs> and 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 it gets corrected because you're working together. So it mm. takes it to a new level of excellence. For example, if I had ten spelling mistakes in uh, one of those book reports in a written form, that could turn someone off the book completely. Yeah, they could be reading a it. Written book. Yeah, like, I don't trust yeah. this writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he don't even know how to spell. How can he give me advice? <laughs> well, what people don't get is this: there's not a single perfect biblical manuscript on planet Earth. There is not a single perfect biblical manuscript on planet Earth. Every time they have to get together, the scholars, and they have to look and say, "Okay, what do you think is here?" And then they put together this perfectly translated, grammatically perfect English translation. Yeah. And they think that that's what was underneath. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is what how I, I refused to go to university and study Bible until I had so much clarity of faith that nothing the atheist or the scholar could do could make me doubt the God I believe in. Right. Right, so okay. I, I, I went through all these experiences and then he sent me to university. So when now I'm in a classroom and they say, no, 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 this is a myth because look, these miracle stories, uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen. Uh, really? God told me in 1991 that my children would be for signs. Yeah. Now, Isaiah 8, 18 says, Here am I in the children God has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahuwah, Sefer, Otto, Dwarves, on Mount Zion. So in 1991, I have a word which says my children are going to be for signs. So 
Um, my first kid born. Okay, that's all good. He's born. It is a sign time. It's uh, the, around the time of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the New Year, and and the Jewish feast at that time, 18th of September. So it would coincide with one of the sign festivals because the sun and the moon and the stars are for signs for seasons or appointed times. So, so then my first daughter is born. She's born on the 3rd of April at 8.03 p.m. 2006. Then my second daughter is born. 3rd of April. 8 p.m. 2008. Same day, same hour, two years apart. What's the sign? Well, at the time I was studying the greatest evangelist in Norwegian history. I'm an evangelist. Hans Nelson Hauger. He was born 3rd of April, 1771. 1771. Now we'll play a little bit with the numbers, the spiritual mindset, the Jewish mindset. 171788. Right, so he was born on the third of April. But then, my kids hear me saying this, and they don't necessarily know all the full significance, and I don't know all the full significance. But after my daughter, sixteen-year-old, a few weeks back, decides to get baptized, she gets baptized at sixteen hundred. Well, she asks to get baptized. She's sixteen years old, and she uh, asks to get baptized. So the church happens to have. A baptism on the 16th of June, and it's at 1600, and she gets baptized. Okay. The next day, she sends me a TikTok, TikTok video demonstrating that Jesus in the traditional Jewish calendar was crucified on the 3rd of April, 33 AD. And she sends me another one talking about NASA finding some kind of semi eclipse on the 3rd of April, 33. AD. So my daughters, who are supposed to be signs, are born on the day when Jesus is redeeming the world from all their sins. That And she sent me that. She sent me those. Um, so how could I make my two daughters get born at the same day, at the same hour, two, two years apart? And so we have things where you cannot just explain even the 24th of the ninth month i didn't control that that guy would send me two thousand dollars but god told me ahead of time from the 24th of the ninth month from this day i will bless you and then two thousand dollars turn up next the next year we didn't even think about it and then on october the 8th the guy tells me 24th of september two thousand three thousand dollars and then when he had bezel down was five thousand bezel was five thousand dollar bill so there's things like this which the Holy Spirit does, the computer crazy, where the computer goes crazy and, 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 and they change their mind about, which which I have put for atheists on Facebook groups, you know. And what I love it when they say, lying for Jesus, because that demonstrates that they just don't believe. They believe I'm making these things up. But if they happen on those dates, like, you know, 24th of the 9th that happened on that date that's that's just a fact isn't it yes that's co the coinc thing. coincidentally today is the 9th of the 9th 24 <laughs> 24th <laughs> of the 9th in reverse very nice very nice and i never even thought about that but yeah that's beautiful <laughs> so so you 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 some of the stuff which I have seen, which convinces me, it makes me laugh when people say, you know, oh, God doesn't exist, or because they say it's in your head, it's all in your head. No, I'm sorry. It's not just in my head. It's something outside and it's controlling and it's uh, organizing and orchestrating. And, and, and he speaks ahead of time and then he does the stuff which he's doing. And and it's a blessing, you know, and, and when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Well, I lived seven years in Israel and I just turned up. I ran out of money after three months. And then I thought, how is God going to keep me here for seven years? You know, so there is something wonderful 
uh, and and that's why the word is living. That's why, yes, I am I'm, I'm I'm so happy that the English Bibles are, are are perfectly grammatically organized and everything, you know. But I don't fight people over inerrancy or stuff like that because God's word is a living word. And what does it mean to be inerrant anyway? God's so flexible. He wrote his book in a Semitic, non-consonantal or consonantal language. In other words, he made it everything flexible. The word can is spelled C-A-N in English, but it's spelled C-N in Hebrew. So it could be can, con, kin, kind, can, can. You don't know what it is until you have the context. And sometimes you can read it this way. For example, when God speaks to Solomon, uh, uh, to Solomon's son, Jeroboam, uh, 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 no, to Solomon's, um, the guy who rebelled against Solomon and took 10 of the tribes with him. And the prophet came to him and said, uh, he took his jacket and ripped it into 10 pieces and said, or 12 pieces and said, take 10. So he took 10, he said, right, God's giving you the 10 tribes. And that was from Solomon's kingdom. It was 12, guy gets 10, and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, gets two or two and a half with the Levites. But the word used for the jacket is Simla. The name of Solomon is Shlomo. The spelling is exactly the same because there are no vowels. So Simla, Shlomo, it's the same word. And the Bible does this all the time. It plays intricately with words like that, Simla, Shlomo, exactly the same words in the text. But later on, the rabbis had to put in the vowels and, 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 and the scholars come in and look at the vowels. But when the text was written in the first place, there were no vowels. <laughs> <laughs> so that means you don't have to argue why do we need to argue if this word betula means virgin and that one means alma means young woman when both are used for both but the jews and the catholics they argue for a thousand years this word is meaning virgin and this one is young woman no they're both both so and that's for you, you for you that's where your focus was when you wrote the inspirational in, inspirational teachings of bethel so how do you hope that listeners to the audio book integrate the teachings from your book, which is a review of other books? How do you hope that they integrate that into their lives? I hope that a married couple who are about to divorce will read that book and think, oh. Or listen to it. <laughs> yes, and, and more importantly, listen to it. Because the the... the the number of reviews which mention the narrator it's 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 quite astonishing listening to the audiobook made the experience even more impactful with the narrator doing an excellent job of bringing the material to life in fact i have a much cheaper book going which i'm doing now because yeah. you know I, I invested in you because you're amazing and i sent them and told them listen to, <laughs> listen to graham <laughs> it completely changed the reading did it oh good good yeah because i it, it, it you carry authority clarity and it means that the here's another one which is nice um Well, I, I will say this. He says, this book, he said he, it was better than he expected. It was better than he expected. I've got like 30 reviews now. Wow. And, and yeah, it's strategized, you know, because they give us those 25 things and I'm, I'm part of groups. But, it was better than he expected. So now, because of the excellence of your narration, I can unashamedly tell people, listen to this. And as I said, 
what I want them to incorporate is connection. If people can start living their lives to connect instead of distance themselves because they want to be right. Danny Silk's importance on connection and then also that radical revelation of forgiveness that people will learn and people have learned. I, I didn't just um, put them together in a book randomly. I put them out first on Academia EDU as book reviews and then I got people saying uh thank you for the review i've been wanting to know about this i have an issue i'm dealing with and they were reading one of the chapters of the book it wasn't a book then right mm -hmm. so i already had i haven't tested it but it was out there and people were literally getting blessed reading it they, they don't have time to read a whole book some of them will go and buy the whole books and that's a well worth it but they were literally already getting blessed. And one of the calls on my life is to bless the families of the earth because I'm like an Abraham. So I will make of thee a great nation. I bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee and him that curse thee will I curse. And in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. God gave me this scripture and he gave it to me three different ways in England back in 1995 when he was calling me out of the world. So I went through a divorce. And when I went through that, I was isolated from the church, isolated from the ministry. Yeah, basically, things go away. And then I'm think they'd already told me, if your marriage does not work, your ministry's over. Well, yeah, that's what we were told back in the day. So I thought it was over. It's over. But then God starts speaking loud. And that's why I have strong testimonies, because he had to call me back. He had to call me back. And so uh, uh, I was in the back of a church in Blackpool, still in and out of the church and in the club. You know, I, 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 let, I moved to Doncaster, I told you. I, I go to a club, which, which I didn't go to until 18. I didn't even listen to the radio. My mother didn't even have us listen to the radio. So I go to a club and I'm dancing with a girl, you know, and then she says, you believe the Bible, don't you? Yeah. Never met her before, just asking her for a dance. And then she asks, you believe the Bible, don't you? Yeah. So then I meet this other girl. I saw, I thought she was really nice. And I, I wanted to talk to her, finally got around to talking to her. And so we were talking and then she says, I says, yeah, yeah, I used to be a preacher, but now I'm a teacher. I'm a religious education teacher. And she goes, no, you're a preacher. I said, no, 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 I'm a teacher. She said, no, you're a preacher. <laughs> she, she, that's another club. And then I was in another club. I was talking to this girl. She was upset. She was down. I said, and then she said she had once upon a time committed her life to Jesus. And so I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, well, then let's pray about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but when I said this, she said, I knew you were different the moment I saw you. So I'm getting this in the clubs. And then I'm, I'm, I'm getting this call. So for example, I go to the, I go to Blackpool. I'm in the church. I'm on my knees at the back because I'm thinking, why do we always bow our hearts and nod our knees? <laughs> we always sing it. We bow our hearts. I mean, what's bowing your heart? So I go to the back so that I can't be seen and I'm bowing my knees before the Lord. And I'm feeling very satisfied. And, and then I said, why am I so satisfied? And then the Holy Spirit said, because I'm about to speak to you. Then the minister gets up and he reads, he prays and then he reads, get out from your country, from your father's house, from your family, to a land that I'll show you. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And that shall be a blessing. I'll bless him that bless thee and I'll curse him that curse thee. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I thought, I just moved here. <laughs> I was just thinking, I just moved here. And that was October the 15th. October the 26th, my mum passes to glory. So I needed a routing because she's the one you go back to, right? Mum, when mum passes, there's nowhere to go back to. And so God was kind of intervening in my life just when my mum was passing on. 
So November the 29th, 1995, the same time, I'm in a, uh, I happen to be in Manchester and I'm visiting to help a Korean guy with a paper he had to write. I was knowing his sis, his, his wife and we were talking and then I met him and, uh, and I was really into tongues at the time. So he was saying that he was having struggles in the Nazarene college and, you know, he's finding it difficult. I said, really? Pray in tongues a lot. And I saw pain. I saw pain on his face when I said praying tongues a lot. And then his wife asked if I would be willing to come and help him. So I was back in London at Kensington Temple. And then I was thinking of going up to help them. And then the Holy Spirit said, um, did you not want to help a man of God? I said, well, yeah. Is not Mr. Cho a man of God? Okay, I'll go today. So I left that day. I went over to uh, Manchester from London. I stayed in their house. I helped him with his English and with his paper he had to write for this thing. We were studying Thomas Cranmer and Henry VIII for his paper. I hadn't studied it much before, but, you know, just trying to get a grip of it. And then because I was there, I decided to visit the Manchester Pentecostal Bible School, which was down the road. I'm a Pentecostal. This was a Nazarene thing. I'm just helping him out. So I go to the Manchester Pentecostal one. I think it was a pastor called George Harris is, is, is teaching. And then he's teaching on uh, Thomas Cranmer and Henry VIII. And he says, and that's the reason the Church of England is such a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> so I put my hand up. I said, well, actually, I disagree. I think I know now, you know, I've been studying this for three days. Uh, actually, I believe Thomas Cameron, because of his humility, he was exalted to the right hand of the throne so that he could stop the influence of the Catholics, etc., etc. And then uh, um, his humility led to his exaltation. And it wasn't like we think it is where it's just you do whatever the king says. He did research. He went to every scholar to find out what is your position on this? What is your... This was not just games like we play today. These people studied. And so I said this, and then he stopped the lecture and he read, get out from your country, from your father's house, from your family, to a land that I'll show you. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. That's so weird. He stopped. He didn't go back to the lecture. He prayed and prophesied over me after that. I thought, so weird. That was November 29th. Finally, I'm in, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in that area and, uh, me and my mate John, my mate John's going to Birmingham. And yes, yes, he's going to Birmingham. So uh, I had gone up to Newcastle, but I decided to come back early. And then I told John I would come back early and could I come with him to Birmingham? And he thought I was a leech and he didn't want me to come to Birmingham. He wanted to be in, in Birmingham with his girlfriend. He didn't want some leech hanging around so we had a big argument all the way to birmingham in birmingham god made a way so that i had a place to stay and then i got talking to someone and he said yeah well the work is worthy of his hire when you work for jesus then he provides and then the holy spirit said to me you haven't done any work yet and so i i went there was a missionaries there i packed up all their envelopes, they left the country and the change from packing and sending the letters I could take. So I got a little bit of money. Then I went out on the street, I was evangelizing and someone gave me a jacket because I was cold, I didn't have much clothes, and they gave me a little bit of money. So there was this kind of change coming on. And then on the way back, John's apologizing. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I get ratty when I want to be with my girlfriend and I got some guy. So I apologize. And I said, oh, it's okay, you know, we're evangelists together. <laughs> So we're coming back. He goes, look, I had a dream about going to Swansea. And this time I'll invite you so it will be different. Okay. So this is December the 20th. I get back into my little house in Livingston Road, um, Blackpool. And I go and I pick out two books from the library. Uh, one here and one there. I take them. One was on Smith Wigglesworth by William Hacking. Smith of Goodsworth raised 14 people from the dead at the turn of the century, and William Hacking was writing about him. The other was about Reese Howes, intercession of Reese Howes. Took them, went to bed, woke up in the morning. I said, Lord, could you please speak to me from this book? 
I pick up the uh, Reese Howells book and it said, now me and John had agreed that we're going to go to Swansea on Boxing Day. That's what we agreed. So I pick up the book, open the page 16. It's called The Intercession of Reese Howells by Roscoe. It says, I remember that Boxing Day in 1934 in the Bible College of Wales in Swansea. Reese Howells came waving the Bible saying, I've been challenged to preach the gospel to every creature in this generation. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So I pick up the other book by William Hacking about Smith Wigglesworth. Lord, can you speak to me from here? It's a letter from Smith Wigglesworth to William Hacking. Brother Hacking, take a look at this report about this man, Reese Howells. This is the other book. It's not my line of faith, but it will build your faith. This book by a letter from Smith Wigglesworth to Hacking, the author, is telling me to read the report about this man, which is in the other book. Wow. And I took these two randomly from two shelves. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, 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 I ring John. I say, John, John, God wants me to go to Swansea. John said, ah, if it had said Africa, would you be off to Africa? He didn't believe. So... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is with you, the answer is yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I did. And later he did. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Well. So, so basically, um, after that, John sent me a message on the answer machine. I can't go to Swansea. Sorry, finish. He was my wheels. I, I had no money. So, Boxing Day came and went, and I never went to Swansea. January the 5th or 6th, I feel pressure on my head. I say, Lord, if you want me to go to Swansea, John's going to have to ring me to confirm it. Within half an hour, we've had no contact for 10 days, two weeks. But within half an hour, the phone rings. John, it's John. He says, I get the feeling I'm in the middle of one of your fleeces. Why did you want me to call you? <laughs> Why did you want me to call you? I said, to see if we're meant to go to Swansea. Because, well, maybe you're meant to go to Swansea, but I'm not going to Swansea. So now we're back in touch. He's on his way over. I'm embarrassed because God's answered my prayer so clearly. John's going to have to ring me to confirm it. But John did not believe. So I still have this niggling uncertainty. So I say, Lord, <laughs> I know it's an embarrassing prayer now. Lord, can you please confirm one more time if you want me to go to Swansea? The bell rings, it's John. The phone rings, it's Enrico from London. We haven't had any contact. He hasn't called me since I left London. Enrico says, have you got your driving license? I says, no. He says, go to Swansea and get it. <laughs> I said, <laughs> wait there. I opened the door. Bring in John. Say to this guy what you just said to me. I told him to go to Swansea and get his driving license. John said, well, maybe you're meant to go to Swansea, but I'm not going to Swansea. I said, right. The moment the Lord gives me some money, I'm going to Swansea. And I got the money because John needed a teacher to teach Korean students. And I got to teach them. And then I got an on, on a, honorarium. I was thinking, hmm. I should get the bus, but the bus won't get me back in time to teach on Monday. It means I have to go with the expensive train. And the Lord says, do as you have promised or be sure your sins will find you out. You know, pray and open. Do as you have promised. So I promised that I would go to Swansea the moment the Lord gave me some money. So I went to Swansea. I stayed in the house of a missionary. And then I went into the school I told them I've got this call to the big world, you know, the world I mentioned before, to bring them all to the Lord. And two people looked at me and they thought, he's a spy. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't believe. So anyway, um, uh, after uh, I got those two guys tricked me in that eyes, I got Mr. Mayton, God-fearing old man, loved me, kind to me. And then I got Billy, who you can't have a conversation. It's like blood out of a stone. And so 
I'm feeling very empty. I'm walking to my room and I'm saying, Lord, I know you sent me, but you're going to help me here. I said, Billy said, you can come and meet these other people. I said, I just need to go to my room a little bit. I needed to recover. So I said, Lord, I know you sent me. Please help me out here. So in the end, he helped me out. And I went to Swansea Bible School for six months. And I arrived in the middle of the semester. And and um, when I'd gone, when I'd finished that day, and I'd gone to two George Streets. There was a George Street in Blackpool, which I had seen in a vision from Doncaster. And after that, I saw the vision of this pub, green pub in George Street, it brought many problems into my life. And then when I went to Swansea, I stayed in a George Street in Swansea. So God's poetic, you choose my way and I'll be with you. And so that's it. <laughs> wow. Well, we've been talking for nearly two hours, Anthony. Oh, but <laughs> which, which is which is fine, which is fine. But you've broke the record for one of these these interviews. This is the longest oh any of them have gone. But it is a fabulous book. It's called Inspirational Teachings of Bethel. You, if you've got this far in this interview, if you've been watching this on whatever you've been watching it on, because it's on many platforms, uh, you've you've met the guy. You've met Anthony Hilton. You know what kind of guy he is. You can imagine what a great book he's written. It's a book review, but there's a lot of him in it too. Uh, you can feel it coming through. Uh, and that's the, that is now an audio book. And if you're watching this on YouTube, if you go to the, the details, to the description in the, in the little blurb there, there's a link there that'll link you straight to Amazon so you can get... It's, it's the direct link to the audio book, but you can also get the, the written version there too. Check it out. Anthony Hilton, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And for a brilliant job in the narration, it was a blessing. <laughs>